Good afternoon to you. Mark Sutter, HurricaneTrack.com, here with your hurricane outlook and discussion. As we go into the Memorial Day weekend, 2021, today is May 28th. Good to see you. we got a lot to talk about, so let's just get right on to it. As you can see there from the title card, it's not only the hurricane outlook and discussion for today's date, we are also going to look at this. You remember Hurricane Laura? Of course you do. And now the Tropical Cyclone Report is officially available from the National Hurricane Center. So I want to start with that. Right in here, the area about wind and pressure, winds, plural, and pressure. Interesting couple of paragraphs here that the peak intensity of Laura was 130 knots, which is about 150 miles per hour. That is a beast of a hurricane. And the lowest pressure that was measured from recon, the Air Force Reserve, and the NOAA reconnaissance was 937 millibars. And they did have 700 millibar flight level winds of 148 knots, corresponding to a surface wind of 133 and 130. And the maximum step frequency microwave radiometer was about 126 and 137. So blending all this gives a landfall intensity of about 130 knots. If we think about what these hurricanes do with their eye walls, there is no way, even with all that recon data, unless you have a whole bunch, you know, 30, 40, 60, 10 meter solid steel or concrete towers with anemometers on them that are all calibrated and perfect and ready to go, sort of like these hurricane sentinels, if you will. There's no way we're going to know what the wind field is of a hurricane for sure. We learned that from Michael. We've learned that from other hurricanes, especially in the last 10 years or so, where there's more of a concerted effort from people like my team, universities, other storm chasers, collecting wind and pressure data. It's difficult at best. I mean, we had a weather station on a bridge near Hackberry that the core went right over and somebody threw it into the Shoepick Bayou. They did. They unlatched it and threw it overboard, uh, and we'll never get the data from that. So it's hard. And so this interesting data here in that first paragraph um, just shows you the complexities of it. There's all kinds of different data from aircraft out there, from the NOAA planes, the, refor the reforce, <laughs> the recon from the Air Force. That's, that's what that is, reforce. The Air Force plane um, and the different measuring devices that they use, including that SFMR, Wow, just a lot of stuff to digest here. Now, what about the pressure? Well, they indicate that the pressure um, was, it says a drop sign in the eye at, at 57 UTC measured a minimum pressure of 938 millibars with a 10 knot wind, meaning that it wasn't quite in the dead center. So they support a central pressure there if you extrapolate it, and by default, and you know, just by extension here, that's what they're doing. They're saying that a drop sign in the eye at this time with a 10 knot wind got a 938 pressure. And you need wind to be as close to zero so that you're not dealing with any type of pressure gradient. Because why do you have wind? You have wind because of the difference in air pressure from point A to point B. If the pressures are the same between those two points are very close to it, there's no exchange of wind. Now, you can argue that you could also have wind if you go like that. You know, if I had a big piece of cardboard and waved it, yes, that makes wind. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about pressure gradient wind, and you get that in the eye of a hurricane. There's wind inside the eye if you're not in the exact center where the pressure gradient is as close to zero as possible. And so when you don't have any wind there, the drop sign's reporting very little to no wind, just one or two knots, then you have a very reliable pressure. So this tells us, and they do their extrapolating, that the minimum pressure was 937 millibars, and so that the 939 millibar pressure at landfall is based on a pressure report of exactly 940.0 with an 11 knot wind at the National Ocean Service station and I never have remembered how you pronounce that. Calcasieu pa Pass, Louisiana, very close to the landfall point. All right, 
that's all well and good. Let's just move on here because I'm going to show you my report in just a minute or our report. All right, in Louisiana, a wind gust to 133 knots was measured at Holly Beach. I believe this is from Mike Tice and Reed Timmer, their um, Windy Palms uh, project where they put an anemometer, an arm young anemometer onto a palm tree. And a gust to 119 was observed at Lake Charles. And there's all this other stuff in here uh, that you can read. So interesting, I want to just kind of point this out right here, that the 939 millibar at landfall, that's what they're going with, 939. All right, so I want to show you our report that was put together as a combination of efforts from yours truly and my colleague Greg Nordstrom and Brent Lynn, who is the author of this. He put all this together. And Mike Farrow, my other colleague from right here in Wilmington, North Carolina. The four of us worked the Laura Field mission. And I know I went over this months and months ago, but maybe you're new to the channel or you didn't watch that video. So here it is again. Here's our data. It's very much like the cyclone report that the Hurricane Center puts out. It's very thorough. Not as in-depth as theirs, but thorough nonetheless. All these different bullet points in here. And the eye, the center of Laura, went right over one of our data sensors right there. Uh, it is a Kestrel Drop 3 sensor. And it was right there in Cameron, Louisiana. The eye went right over it. And then we had some other equipment right there. That's the one that got thrown into the bayou by some jerk, you know, who ruined everything. Awful, awful, awful. Uh, and there's no other explanation for it. That thing's anchored down. The wind didn't do it, and it disappeared when the wind was still 30, 40 miles per hour. That's when it stopped reporting. Somebody drove by that bridge, un unscrewed it from the concrete jersey wall, and just tossed it over into the bayou. That's the best that we can surmise. But whatever. So here's our pressure traces from the various in sundry uh, instruments that we had in different places. We had Port Arthur. Uh, which recorded 988, Sabine Pass, you know, closer to the center here, 980, so an 8 millibar gradient difference there. Johnson Bayou, 972, getting closer. Lake Charles up to the north, 953. And then Cameron, Louisiana, 1.3 miles to the best that we can surmise from the data, from the exact center of the eye, and we recorded an estimated, extrapolated, 936 millibars. That's three millibars lower than they are going with officially. How did we get to this? Well, our pressure sensor, again, it's a Kestrel Drop 3 sensor, and it was attached inside, it was inside of a box, one of our camera boxes there, on a utility pole, so it was probably 12 feet above ground, so about four meters above the ground, and it was inside of this box. The box is not airtight. Air can pass through. It's nice because the little pressure valve on the Pelican case does allow for air pressure changes, and it mitigates the passage of strong wind, which you can get wild fluctuations in the pressure because of that, and so it's a very reliable way of capturing air pressure. Now, what is this extrapolation stuff? Well, what happened was, if we zoom down here, I think I've got it in here somewhere, if I can find it. Um, there was a time period that, there it is, sorry, I just got to zoom in on it for you. There was a time period where the pressure went up dramatically. And we were trying to figure out what the heck happened. And what we figured out was that the utility pole had snapped in the wind and fell into the storm surge that had come in, submerging the box and the pressure sensor underwater for that period of time. And so what is water? Water is denser than air. So of course the pressure shot up. And then once the eye passed and the water level went down, the pressure sensor was exposed to the air again, the box was, and uh, we got a, uh, the return to normal. So what about that in-between time? Well, we had a friend of ours that works for the SAS Institute up in Cary, North Carolina, to go over the data using AI, artificial intelligence, and extremely powerful software, and it gave us an extrapolation in here equaling 
an estimated 936 millibars. You just continue on, the computer does its thing based on all kinds of interesting calculations. That's what this is for. And we surmised that it was about 936 millibars at Cameron, Louisiana. You know, and so you could say, maybe you're off by one millibar. Maybe you're off by two. Well, that's still 938, and that's still one millibar lower than the official NOAA Ocean Service. And I'm just saying, other people are doing research and observations. There's other universities. There's Weatherflow, a fantastic company that's got instruments out there. And I thought that I read somewhere that they had a 936 millibar reading in Cameron as well. There's a lot to look at, but I'm just putting this out there for the public so that you can see this as it augments, not contradicting, but augments the report from the National Hurricane Center. They have to look at a lot of information. We are a privately funded, well, private as in you guys fund it. We're crowdfunded, you know, so it is private, right? It's not my own money. I'm not Bruce Wayne. I don't have billions of dollars sitting in some trust fund somewhere that I can go do this. So we are, we're, we're funded from the public, but it's a private enterprise, if you will. We're not the government, that's the, that's the bottom line. Anyway, that's our data, that's what it looked like. And uh, you can see the rest of the report. I will put a link to it in the description of today's video. The Hurricane Center report and our report Amazing detail here where we had the sensors in relation to the core. Brent did a fantastic job. This is our wind data. This data from Sabine Pass, Texas-Louisiana border there, made it into the Tropical Cyclone report. They cited my name, and that was very nice of them to do that. I appreciate that. I don't know why the other data didn't get in there. That's not up to me. We submitted this. They used different pieces of data. That's fine. This is why I wanted to put this out there for you guys, just to show you, again, I think this augments on top of the official report from the fine men and women at the National Hurricane Center. Hurricane Laura, a most impactful Category 4, we all remember that. What a day. A lot of people still dealing with the aftermath of that, and they will for a generation or two. It's one of those generational hurricanes. So there you go. That's how we start off today's discussion. All right, at least the tropics are not producing anything remotely close to a Laura today or anytime soon. Looking out across the main development region, still have these strong upper level winds blowing across briskly and keeping things sheared. If there were any tropical waves out here that would try to flare up, they can forget about it. Basically, it looks like some energy right here getting ready to approach the southern windward islands with a limited convection, but you can see all kinds of upper level winds, just generally everything moving from west to east, and it's May, it's only May 28th, I mean, we still have a two or three months, hopefully, until things were to get busy. I got a lot to do, uh, you know, and nobody needs hurricanes, right? I mean, we do in the scheme of things, if we didn't have hurricanes, as Dr. Neil Frank once said, I think he's a doctor, PhD, maybe he's not. Anyway, Neil Frank once said, if you didn't have hurricanes, you might have something worse. So they do serve a purpose. They just become a major pain in the butt when we get in their way. This is an interesting area to watch in the Eastern Pacific. And as such, the National Hurricane Center issuing outlooks about it. Nothing in the Atlantic, of course, but in the Eastern Pacific, 20%, 30%, 0%, 30%. Not very high probabilities overall, and both systems would move farther out into the open Pacific. So anyone with plans along the Baja or Mexico proper, the Pacific coast there, not to worry, nothing to uh, even consider from those systems. So in the Atlantic, as we look at the 850 millibar level of the GFS, Western Atlantic over the next few days, None of these areas of vorticity, those little yellow areas you see moving from uh, east to west, nothing to really write home about. Look, you can see one of the tropical waves right there. Well, if I outline it where you can see it, you can. Right there, there's a tropical wave. You can see it represented at the 850 millibar level. Another little kink in the height line there. You know, just little ripples of energy, but nothing closing off. None of those yellow areas of vorticity 
coming together. But you know what? You can definitely see the outline of the Bermuda High over here, stronger and stronger, flexing its muscle, getting the setup for maybe later in the season. We'll see. I've seen some talk about that. Um, we don't like to speculate, but more people kind of chiming in that the season could be more active than they once thought. And I'm going to show you that before we're done. I'm not just going to throw that out there and then not back it up with some evidence, at least to support what I'm talking about. Anyway, this gets us out to a week well into the first few days of June. This is valid June the 4th, and nothing at all brewing, at least in the modeling for now. In the Eastern Pacific, no big deal here with these systems. Even if they develop, they're going to head off to the west. There's five days out, six days, and seven days. No problems there. That's good. All right, so over at storm2k.org, storm2k.org, they're the only major website, by the way, that is a supporter through Patreon of our efforts over here at Hurricane Track. And I really appreciate that. Um, just wanting you to know that. They are, uh, I mean, this site, I've been a member of Storm 2K since I think 03. And I love reading the different posts from people. They are very civil. They are well moderated. And they know what they're talking about. They're focused on it. And I love it. So I go in and I kind of see what people are talking about. You get sort of a, um, a read on how things are going. And they also post their members um, relevant information, such as the latest forecast here from TSR. Who was that? That's Tropical Storm Risk. It is a British-based firm that does hurricane forecasting from the UK. You might be thinking, why the UK? Like, as in United Kingdom? Yes. Well, there's different reasons. Part of it is they work with insurance companies and reinsurers. I mean, there's a lot of reasons behind it. But yes, the UK, I mean, come on. We have hurricane forecasts from Colorado State University. So whatever. It's great. These folks know what they're talking about. They're working on it. It's not perfect. The weather prediction is not perfect. Even five hours from now, you know, you think about supercell development or whatever. I mean, we're working on it as a human race. We've come a long way. We have a long way to go. Anyway, uh, these are the people behind it. Um, Professor Mark Saunders and Dr. Adam Lee over here from the Department of Space and Climate Physics from University College in London. So there you go. You know, some credibility there. What are they saying? What's the bottom line? Well, basically, as Luis here, that's Cyclone I, I know him as Luis down in Puerto Rico, they raised their numbers from April, 17 named storms, 8 hurricanes, 3 majors, and their May forecast is now 18, 9, and 4. That's a pretty substantial increase, and in fact, if we go look and see in here, they're basically calling for a very active season. They've never called for more than four major hurricanes. So that's a pretty substantial number there, that four right there, four major hurricanes, nine hurricanes total from these folks here at TSR. Something to take note of, all right? Also, in the indicators department, um, this poster here, I do not know their proper name. We know them as Shell Mound. And I really like some of the, the, the different people post just some amazing analysis. Uh, and you see this on social media, on Twitter, but Twitter's limited to what is it, 240 characters now? And, um, well, here on a message board, the old fashioned message boards, you can get a full on report from people. And I really like that. And so, uh, Shell Mound here was mentioning that with the Madden-Julian oscillation entering a low amplitude in phases 7 and 8, basically that's favoring the Western Hemisphere through the Atlantic Basin over the next few weeks, this should be and already is promoting prolonged low-level westerlies over the main development region. The seven-day sea dash trends are finally showing substantial warming setting in over the past several days. Just as the 5,000 foot or 850 millibar westerlies have begun to kick in on the Hav Muller diagrams. More importantly, the mid latitude or subtropical Atlantic is cooling, which supports further warming over the main development region in line with the climate forecast system V2, that's the CFS V2 forecast for early June. Hmm. It's showing that the Atlantic is warming, the trend is starting. The engine is revving, whatever you want to call it. So he goes on to say, 
he or she, I don't know this person personally, uh, given the increasing likelihood of cool neutral ENSO persisting through August, September, October, with the warmest anomalies being centered near the international dateline, which is farther to the west versus closer to South America, the Nino 1-2 region, Eastern Pacific. And here's the punchline. I'll outline it in red. I think I am finally beginning to sign on to the likelihood of a potentially hyperactive season, and this person has adjusted their numbers accordingly. These are folks, and this is why I rely on this message board, they don't screw around. They're not hypers. You know what I mean? They're, they look at this stuff, and they, and they have an analysis that's based in reality, not hype forecasting or hoping to get the most views on YouTube or a billion shares of an image or whatever. They just see what they see and they talk about it. And I like that, and that's why I bring it up. So this is really interesting uh, as to what they're saying. And then there's articles that have been written. I saw this, the Florida What If thing that... Uh, I think Ken Graham produced this, kind of talking about Florida's string of good luck lately, and you shift all those tracks from last year several hundred miles east, or if Florida was farther to the west, yes, you know, you can play what if all along. But we're just starting to see some signs here that the potential for Florida Peninsula of getting impacted this year may be on the increase, and that's interesting. So we'll have to keep an eye on how things progress um, different articles from different people out there. I just wanted to show you this from Storm 2K because I thought it was relevant and quite well thought out. All right, moving on. Lower 48 weather. One thing that is extremely important, your safety. Yeah, we'll do feedback another time. Thank you. When you see these little colors here, sea green or whatever that is, that should re really jump out at you. This should be as dangerous to you as a tornado warning, in my opinion or at least a watch. Rip current statement, beach hazard statements, this bluish area, blue-green, along the North Carolina coast here, you gotta be careful of that. No, there's no hurricanes causing these waves and rip currents right now, but it doesn't matter. They are still there, they are dangerous, and lots of people are headed to the beach. So hear me when I tell you, be careful. If you know people heading down there, they got little kids, whatever, please, even big kids, and I do too. Mine are at the beach as I speak. They're down there with my wife at Wrightsville Beach. And I told them you have to be extremely careful, no more than waist deep, because these rip currents are a big problem. And it's not just here in the Carolinas. If we go look at the weather.gov homepage again up here in the Northeast, at least water temperatures are colder here. Not too many people hopefully venturing in the water just yet off of Long Island. It's going to be kind of yucky up there. I mean, look, it's 65 degrees. Pass. But nevertheless, if you're going out in the water in this area, the rip current statements are in effect there. You can get all this information and more at weather.gov weather and look at the legend right here. This tells you everything you want to know, and those are the ones you want to read right there relating to beach forecasts. Rip currents is outlined there. It's a big deal. They kill people. They go on vacation, and somebody, unfortunately, doesn't make it back home uh, that's very sad, very unfortunate, and it's often people from way out of state. In our area, it's Ohio and Kentucky where we're seeing the loss of life come from. People visit Brunswick, New Hanover, the Carteret County beaches, the beaches of Dare up in the Outer Banks and vicinity. Be very careful, all right? Without you over there, right there, if you're not there, there's no reason for me to be here. All right, Storm Prediction Center, as we round things out for today's discussion, Enhance Risk Today. In Texas, again, gorilla hail, maybe some tornadoes, you know, that kind of thing. You get used to it by now. But, man, that hail thing, that's a big deal. That's a lot a lot of damage that can get done by the hail. So pay attention. Be aware. Tomorrow, the threat, much less. But it's still there. Slight risk with a marginal risk along the dry line. Day three, still in the western Texas area. i tell you, again, I would just love to be able to teleport or get in my own Gulfstream 4 or 5 if I had one, fly out to Amarillo, whoops, I missed it, drive down and check this out. Wouldn't that be neat if you just teleport, whatever. Bottom line, be mindful, it's out there, severe weather still an issue, even as we get close to hurricane season. Speaking of that, I do have a podcast out, available to all free of charge on anywhere you get podcasts, really. It's called Hurricane Season, the podcast, a morning 
short update, like a digest of here's what I'm looking at. It gives you an idea in five minutes or less, which is a big contra, what's the word I'm looking Contrast, and big contrast in stark contrast to these lengthy videos here. But the videos are where I can go into detail and tell you what I'm thinking, and that's what these are for. But these little short podcasts every morning, every single morning throughout the hurricane season, it's available on your device of choice. Spotify, Google Podcast, Apple, you can even ask Alexa, and it'll play it through Spotify, I think. Subscribe to it, check it out every day, and as things get more busy, and they eventually will, um, the podcast will get more in-depth, of course. And what I basically do is tell you what I'm looking at and what we will talk about in the video for that day. All right? Also, Patreon. That's how we are supported. I've talked about this before uh, as in terms of how we get our funding. This is it. And for as little as $10 a month, come on, you get access to everything we do. 25 bucks a month and up, you get different perks and rewards, if you will. As an investor in the future of hurricane coverage, especially out on the field, patreon.com slash hurricane track. I'm going to talk about it more on Monday. I'm actually going to do about an hour long video, not live. I'm just going to produce it kind of like I'm doing this with different slides and graphics and whatnot. And part of that is I'm going to go into detail about exactly what we have done with and will continue to do with Patreon and how we tie that in to our Hurricane Track Insider site. And it's more than just begging for money. It really gets annoying when people say that. It's like, do you work for free? And not only do we not work for free here, we do a lot of incredible things. And it is because of awesome people like you that are in the position to support the future. I mean, it goes beyond what you see on TV. And of course, the internet does as a whole. And we're taking full advantage of that. And I'll talk about it in more detail on Monday. All right, so what I'm going to do is take Saturday and Sunday off from doing a video. I'll still have the morning podcast. Those are a lot easier to produce, of course. And then Monday, um, May 31st, the day before hurricane season, I will produce a one-hour update, video, whatever, kickoff, as we get ready for hurricane season 2021. And then Tuesday, June 1st, we're back on. The clock starts, so to speak. It's already started, but it's just a calendar thing. You know that. We already had Anna, for goodness sakes, so whatever. But it does officially begin Tuesday, June the 1st, and I'll have an hour-long update and inside look at what we do, some of the projects we're going to have for this year, so forth and so on, and I'll put, uh, put that together for you on Monday, Memorial Day. Have a great weekend. Stay safe out there. Again, watch those rip currents if you're heading to the beach. I'm serious about that. I need you guys because without you, what am I going to do? Nothing, and we can't be having that. Have a great weekend. I am Mark Sutteth, HurricaneTrack.com. I'll talk to you again on Monday.